Brad Keithley, Managing Director of Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Welcome to the weekly top three, the top three things on our mind here at Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets for the week of October 14th, 2019. The weekly top three is a regular segment on The Michael Duke Show. The show broadcasts on Facebook Live and via streaming audio from the show's website weekdays from 6 to 8 a.m. I join Michael on Tuesdays from 6.20 to 7 a.m. for a discussion between the two of us about our three issues. We post the podcast of our discussion following the show on the Alaska for Sustainable Budgets Facebook, YouTube, and SoundCloud pages, and on my website at bgkeithley.com. You can find past episodes of the weekly top three also at the same locations. Keep in mind that in addition to these podcasts, during the week you also can follow and participate in the discussion with us of these and other issues affecting Alaska's fiscal and economic condition by following us on the Alaska for Sustainable Budgets Facebook page and through our posts on Twitter. This week, our top three issues are these. First, rather than acting as a nonpartisan source of analysis, the Alaska Legislature's Legislative Finance Division is stacking the information deck being given to Alaskans. Second, what is the difference between the current statute and a 50 50 POMV permanent fund dividend? And third, what's the effect on the budget and Alaskans of adopting a 50 50 POMV permanent fund dividend? And now, let's join Michael. I want to take a crack at uh, this first piece. And of course, uh, we're going to talk about the Alaska Legislative Finance Division and the PFD Working Group and how. Alaska Ledge uh, Finance is trying to rig the PFD debate uh, in their favor, and you've got some visual aids to talk about uh, with this uh, as well, which uh, we'll put some links up in the chat room for folks to be able to go out and view it later if they miss it. Uh, but let's uh, let's talk about that. Well, let's step back for a second to, to 2017 or before 2017. Before 2017. The PFD, for purposes of the budget, was treated as, as something that was a, essentially an off-budget item. It, for a number of years, it was put in the other category. Uh, for uh, 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 another set of years, it was put in the designated funds category, which means it wasn't part of unrestricted general funds that the legislature annually sort of went in and worked with. It was designated for a specific purpose and set aside for that purpose, and the revenues weren't mixed uh, with unrestricted general funds. Um, and, it, and it was treated that way from 1982 until 2017. In 2017, uh, Ledge Finance, which is, is the advisors, the fiscal advisors to the legislature, Ledge Finance, at the, at the urging, uh, but, but nonetheless uh, on their own, uh, at the urging of, Senate, of the Senate Finance co-chairs, but nonetheless, Ledge Finance made the decision to do it, changed the PFD revenues from designated general funds or, or other uh, funds to unrestricted general funds. And the impact of that was all of a sudden to put, to put P, all of the revenues otherwise that should go for the PFD into the general fund and then make uh, uh, the PFD a general fund spending item. Before that, it had always been treated off to the side, non-budget, revenues weren't in. Um, uh, but, but in 2017, with the change in how they were doing the, how, how they were putting the budget together and how they presented it uh, in the fiscal charts, all of a sudden it became general revenue, unrestricted general revenue, available to the leg legislature generally, and, uh, and, and the PFD became a spending item. This was even before the Supreme Court case. Right. Um, uh, that they did this. So right. so they 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 all of a sudden changed the nature of or, or the, the, the way in which the PFD was treated. That had the effect. That's had the effect of of giving credence to the to the arguments that Senator von Imhoff and Senator Stedman and, and, and Senator Coghill and others now make that, oh, the PFD is just part of general funds. PFD is spending uh, out of general funds, and so we've got to we've got to make the hard choices. We, the legislators, have to make the hard choices about what we're going to spend money on, and we're not going to spend it on the PFD. We're going to spend it on on other things um, instead. They didn't. They didn't. That conversation wasn't a conversation 
that occurred before 2017 because we had it we had it categorized where it should be, frankly, uh, under designated general funds. So that that action by the leg legislative finance changed the debate in 2017. Now, fast forward to 2019 and to the PFD working group, the legislators, legislature's bicameral PFD working group, um, and, and ledge finance once again is getting involved in the process uh, and, and, and dealing with, with the PFD. You can find the, the, the PFD working group has created a website called pfdalaska.org, uh, and on this website they've added something new that's called an interactive Excel model. And that model supposedly enables citizens to go in, legislators and citizens and others, to go in and, and, calc and, and show what they would do or calculate what they would do, uh, how they would deal with, with the budget issues. And when you go to this model, uh, it, it shows the uh, spending levels and it shows uh, revenue levels um, and it shows uh, the PFD. So you can, they allow you to change uh, the oil price, uh, so you can change, uh, uh, make your own assumption about oil price, and you can change the amount of oil, uh, oil revenues. And then they show you the options, and then you have a shortfall after whatever oil revenue you, you pick, you, you end up with a shortfall unless you pick an unrealistic number like $100. Uh, but you, you pick an oil price that you think is realistic, shows the budget shortfall, and then it gives you essentially one option for dealing with the budget shortfall, and that is cutting the PFD. <laughs> so there, th this whole model is built, is built around trying to convince you that the only way to deal with the budget shortfall uh, is to cut the PFD. Now, interestingly, they don't tell you you can do this, but interestingly, you can go in and play with the spending numbers, and you can find how much we would have to reduce spending in order to balance the budget. Um, but the only revenue option and the only the only clear option they give you on how to deal with this is by cutting the PFD. And once again, Ledge Finance is trying to lead Alaskans through this interactive model. First, they first they led Alaskans to say uh, to try to lead Alaskans to be able to claim that it was unrestricted general funds. Now they're trying to lead Alaskans to say the only solution to the to the budget crisis we have is by cutting the PFD. It's just a question of how much you cut. Just a question of how much you cut the PFD. A fair, fairer approach uh, to to the situation would have been to put in other revenue options. We have them, uh, uh, or uh, make the, the the ability to cut spending uh, explicit uh, in this model and allow Alaskans to see. If we adopted, for example, a flat tax, or if some, as some people advocate, a sales tax, or a combination of spending cuts um, and, and, and other uh, revenue approaches, um, it, a fair approach would be allow would be to set up a, a model that allowed Alaskans to see how those interplayed. But but one more time, ledge finance, no doubt, at the urging of the Senate Finance Committee co-chairs. And, and probably this time the House Finance Committee co-chairs, Ledge Finance is trying to drive Alaska Alaskans to a single conclusion, and that single conclusion is that you have to cut the PFD. I was playing with the model the, late last night and this morning looking at this, and I you, you said we could change the budget numbers. <clears throat> I've clicked in every square that I could find. I can't even figure out how to do that. Um, and, and, you know, I'm kind of, P, I'm kind of Excel savvy, so I was like, how do I make some changes? And I can't. And I'm like, okay, well, the, the, obviously they're trying to drive us to one conclusion here. Yeah, exactly right. You can, you can, I mean, you can click on the, you can click on the uh, cells, and you can change the numbers in the in the spending cells. They don't tell you you can do that. And, and now that I've mentioned it, they may block it. But uh, you can do that, and uh, and that gives you the that gives you the ability to change. Uh, the, the spending numbers and to see what uh, what what changing those spending numbers would do, but the only one the the only tool they try to they the, they they give you explicitly is to um, uh, is to change oil prices uh, or uh, to change uh, PFD levels, and then that will move the that will move the numbers on the chart uh, and show uh, how much of the quote budget deficit that you've closed as a result of changing the PFD levels. I it's just it's a manipulation. 
and and that is and it's a rigging of the system by the government to try to lead you to only one conclusion and i just find that objectionable just like changing the designation the classification of of pfd revenues in 2017 opened up this whole argument about well they're just government revenues and 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 pfds are government spending and it's got to compete with other government spending that 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 debate didn't occur before 2017 that's that's not how the numbers uh, were set up it's not how the statute sets the numbers up but in 2017 they changed the classification of those numbers and they opened up that whole debate and now uh, with this with this model they're trying to they're trying to narrow it down even further and say well the only way to change the budget the only way to to, to fill the budget uh, is through uh, cutting the PFD. What are the chances, Brad, of going back to that uh, categorizing the PFD as other or designated funds? I mean, what's is the genie out of the bottle? Can we not put that back to where it was so if this debate goes away? Or are these people just so enamored with all that money that they just can't see it any other way? Well, the statute's still on the books, and the statute still designates the funds for the PFD. I mean, if if we had another set of Senate Finance co-chairs, if Shelley Hughes and Mike Shower, just to pick two people, were the Senate Finance co-chairs, um, and and the House Finance and the House Finance co-chairs were were agreeable, presumably they could direct legislative finance to change it back. I I don't know. I mean, maybe legislative finance would resist doing that, but presumably they could change it back. The statute that's what that's the way the statute actually actually reads. I mean, you've got other things. Like community assistance, uh, or like the uh, uh, the the uh, what, what's the name of the of the energy fund? Oh, the uh, the uh, anyway, it, yeah, it's the Alaska. <clears throat> yeah, it's the rural energy fund is what you're talking about. The uh, yeah, yep. Those those are those are similar in that they have statutes that say these revenues shall go to these purposes, and the and the ledge finance still has them in DGF. Every other category that has a statute, every other segment that has a statute that says these funds are to go someplace, they're designated for some use, the, the Ledge Finance still has them over in DGF. The only one they've broken out, and again, again, the, the, PDF, the PFD statute is still on the books, but the only one, the one they've broken out to treat differently is, is the PFD. Um, and they've said even though, it's, even though it's designated in the statute, we're going to treat it as unrestricted general funds. So the statute's still on the books. If you had the Senate, fi- if you controlled the Senate Finance co-chairs um, and House Finance co-chairs, you you should be able to uh, to set it back. I mean, Bert, these people that argue there's a conflict between SB 26 and and the PFD statute are wrong. There's not a conflict from a lawyer's standpoint. There's not a conflict. The two are entirely compatible. You can only take so much. SB 26 says you can only take so much. From, from the permanent fund each year. Fine. And then the PFD statute says of that that you take from the permanent fund, a portion of a, a segment of that has to go, the statutory portion has to go to the PFD. That's entirely compatible. Uh, the problem is the legislature wants to spend more from what they take from the, uh, from the, from the permanent fund the, under SB 26. They want to spend more um, and so it, when you when you spend more and you apply the PFD statute, you're ending up using more than what the than what SB 26 says you can take can take out of the uh, uh, take out of the permanent fund. And so they're declaring that a conflict. Right. It's not a conflict because of the PFD statute. It's a conflict because of the amount they want to spend uh, from the from the from the amount taken from the permanent fund. Right. It's only a conflict because they want to continue with business as usual and keep their spending. At the level that they've uh, that they've historically been doing, and that's part of the problem. Um, and 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 that's this whole thing. This whole thing has been a shell game. And again, as I mentioned earlier, if there's any kind of problem, this is a problem of their own making. I mean, the law was already on the books for 30 years, and now they've created a new law and said, "Well, these are in conflict. We've got to ignore the first one, even though it's been there for 30 years. You're the ones that have created the problem. Maybe you ought to uncreate it or uh, you know, got up and say, here's what we need to do to fix it. And, and they just, they're not doing that. Well, and they're not being honest with Alaskans. I mean, they're, they're, they're I, I, that, that may be a harsh thing to say, but it's true. They're not being honest with Alaskans. In 2017, 
they changed what was a what was an appropriate designation to something that is entirely inappropriate compared to how they treat all of the other categories of designated funds and and then just started changing changing how they talked about it having changed that having changed that 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 classification now with this model they're they're saying the only way to fix the budget essentially this model says the only way to fix the budget is through pfd cuts they're not being honest with alaskans there are other options they're not putting them on the table uh and they're trying to just foreclose debate uh through frankly the brute use of of the of the control they have over the legislative finance division and then yeah. you know once the legislative finance division does that then the media picks up on it and says, well, there's a conflict between X and Y, between this statute and that statute. There's not. Uh, or <laughs> unrestricted or PFDs are unrestricted general funds. They aren't. But 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 once once they use the brute force of changing that verbiage, ledge finance changes the verbiage, then the media gets in line, then the editorial boards get in line, and, and Alaskans are being misled. I think that they fixed the um... – I think they fixed that interactive model because I cannot modify the budget amount. Um, I mean, I'm there's only a set number of squares that I can click, and none of them allow me to click into the background to the actual uh, b- budget formula. I can't fix it. All right. So, but so I mean, I, no, I can't. I can't. I can't change the number. Uh, I've clicked all over the. I mean, like I said, I'm pretty Excel savvy. And I can't click into any of the revenue areas to get those. So I think that they fixed it probably since you started. You sent me a link, but uh, uh, I think I think it may have been fixed in the meanwhile. You know what I mean? That could be. I downloaded it early once it once the, when it first came out, uh, and maybe that they still had that uh, Excel cell open that you could that you could change. So if they've done that, if they've closed off that cell, if they've locked that cell. That means the only thing they're allowing you to change is the oil price assumption and and the dividend. Uh, yep. They're not even allowing you to change uh, spending levels anymore. That's it. That's totally true. I can't I can't do budget amounts. I can't hit any of the other squares. The only squares I can click in are the top ones, either under the PFD amount or the oil price options, which I just found hysterical because that just means, like you said, they're totally driving the debate to just say it's a question of where does oil go and how much of a PFD do you want? You know, Michael, I would expect that out of an interest group. I would expect somebody to come out with a model like that out of an interest group that that uh, you know was was trying to s- steer the debate uh, in their in their direction and really didn't want to you know give uh, opponents an opportunity to to do this. But this is the government. This is legislative finance, which you know if you read if you read the newspaper articles it tells you it's a it's a nonpartisan. There for the best interests of Alaskans. The division is there for the best interests of Alaskans. A governmental agency that 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 you can rely on to tell the truth and to and and is is nonpartisan in how they advise the legislature. It's the government that is that is foreclosing your consideration of of legitimate options. And these aren't these aren't squirrely options. I mean, both the ICER analysis and the ITEP analysis. Uh, from uh, from t- 2016 and 2017, uh, respectively, tell you that cutting the PFD has the largest adverse impact on the Alaska economy and on Alaska families. There are other options that are better. A progressive income tax, a flat income tax, a sales tax, all produce better impacts, better outcomes for Alaska families and the Alaska economy. So these aren't, these aren't off-the-board options. These are what the what the the analysts have said are better options, and yet uh, legislative finance uh, is foreclosing uh, Alaskans' ability to see them by by rigging the model they're giving Alaskans to show only one one option. Yeah, no, it's uh, it's 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 spooky. <laughs> it is really spooky uh, in, in what they're doing, and uh, and it's obvious that this is again. It's like leading the goat to the to the slaughterhouse uh, and and just telling it it's all going to be okay, um, which is it is just excruciatingly frustrating. Um, I, I think you're right. I think if we could change the narrative again, if we could reverse the narrative on this and put this back into um, you know and put this back into that uh, the formula of of yes. other category or the DGF category, we could fix this. But again, it leaves it. 
it leaves it at the whim of future legislatures. So I think ultimately, in my mind, the idea is still it still has to be a um, a uh, uh, a constitutional change. Am I am I wrong? No, no, that's exactly right. I mean, the, the Supreme Court essentially says the legislature can do whatever they want whenever they want. Uh, forget statutes, uh, at least with respect to fiscal matters. Uh, forget statutes. The legislature can make it up as they go along. So, yeah, even if even if the Senate reorganized and and again, just just to pick two, Shelley Hughes and Mike Shower were the were the Senate finance co-chairs and fixed this and 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 respected Alaskans and were honest with Alaskans and treated the, P- the PFD the way that other designated general funds are treated, uh, yeah, uh, the next election could wipe them out and, and we'd go right back to where we were. So, yes, a constitutional fix is the only way permanently to take this off the table. I, uh, I, I, <clears throat> I'm so frustrated by this. And, of course, just watching what's happening right now in the legislature is um, – is, is, is super frustrating. And the fact that ledge finance seems to be leading the charge on this. And of course, David Teal has been anti PFD for a very long time uh, is, is very frustrating to say the least. We definitely have to change the players out in this whole game when it's all said and done. Um, We're about 25 seconds out, Brad, final thought. Final thought is, is this, this shouldn't be happening. And any legislators listening or any legislators that, that you talk to, we need we need ledge finance to become honest an honest broker not be biased yeah absolutely uh, we've been talking about the uh, pfd and where it goes from here now we're getting into number two and three today number two and three specifically going to be talking about the uh, uh the 50 50 pomv draw and how it affects especially now that shelly hughes has come out Uh, kind of championing uh, championing that as the grand compromise. Uh, Brad, your thoughts on the uh, on the 50 50 split. What does it mean for the P for the PFD? What's the impact on the budgets and on Alaskans? Well, let's let's start by talking about what what the change is that that Shelley's talking about. So so listeners understand that currently um, the, the, the current statute. PFD statute says that Alaskans will get 50% of statutory net earnings. And we've historically talked about that as a 50-50 split between Alaskans and government, but it's really not. Uh, This didn't matter up until we got into this fiscal crisis and government started drawing on its share. Um, So I can understand why this has never been a discussion before this time. But but the the so-called 50-50 split that's in the statute really isn't isn't that 50 percent of it 50 percent of statutory net earnings does go to citizens but on the other side on the other 50 percent a significant portion of that 50 percent goes to inflation proofing it doesn't go to government it goes back into the permanent fund to inflation proof the permanent fund and that's about that's about uh, uh, twenty or twenty five percent, or about fifty percent rather of the other of the other fifty percent, about twenty five percent of the whole. So by the time you wash that out, the real split that's going on under the current statute is fifty percent to Alaska citizens, about uh, twenty five about twenty five percent to to uh, inflation proofing the permanent fund, and about twenty five percent to government. Government's not getting 50 percent of those statutory net earnings because of the way that inflation proofing is working now inflation proof when you think about inflation proofing it benefits the pfd it benefits both the pfd share and it benefits the government share because it's keeping the size of the permanent fund adjusted uh, for inflation and making sure that it doesn't deteriorate the size of the fund and the power of the fund doesn't deteriorate as a result of inflation. So it's benefiting both sides of, of the equation. What, what, it, what, 50-50 PO, what, what POMV 5050 does is say essentially this. It says, okay, we understand the inflation-proofing share should be taken out of both sides. It shouldn't be taken just out of government. It should be taken out of both sides. And, fi- and the 50-50 split should occur after inflation proofing is taken care of. Essentially what POMV, percent of market value does, is say we're gonna take the real rate of return, the after inflation rate of return out of the permanent fund, 
um, and leave the inflation portion, the portion needed to inflation-proof the permanent fund, in the permanent fund. And so POMB is just is just deducting inflation first, and then pulling earnings out the after inflation uh, earnings out of the fund. POMB 5050 then is splitting those after inflation earnings 50% to the to the PFD and 50% to government um, instead of instead of of, of only applying the inflation proofing share uh, to government share. Frankly, I think it, I've, I've written a piece on this uh, in the past, and I'll post it up again sometime today. Frankly, I think that that the POMB 5050 approach is closer to what Hammond intended than than the current statutory approach. They did the current statutory statutory approach back in 1982 before inflation was before the inflation proofing. Uh, uh, amount was significant, uh, and at a time that government didn't need the other 50%. So it was fine. Uh, nobody really cared if you if you applied all of the inflation inflation proofing portion over to uh, over to government share over to the other 50%. But now that we've gotten to the point where inflation proofing is significant, it is a significant amount, and government is 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 looking for its share uh, of the permanent fund earnings in order to help. Uh, in order to help uh, 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 offset uh, the loss on the oil side. Now, where inflation proofing goes is a big deal, matters a lot. Um, and and I think I think in Hammond's vision, uh, I think Hammond's vision always was these were after inflation numbers. Um, and I think doing POMB and and taking inflation, the inflation amount off of both sides uh, is the right way to do it. So I support Shelley's move. To, to POMB 5050, I think it's the right, uh, the right uh, structure and the right approach and the right treatment uh, of inflation proofing and the right split uh, between uh, between government uh, and uh, and the citizens. Now, what does it mean overall for the price or the amount of the PFD? It means that in the long run there is a lesser amount. Uh, I mean, I guess in the short term, but in the long run, it stabilizes the fund. Is that what you're saying? In the long run, it stabilizes the fund, and it treats the citizen's share and the government's share equally. It, it treats both. Um, uh, it, 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 it takes it, it takes into account the inflation, the cost of inflation proofing, uh, on both uh, the PFD and on the government's share. So it stabilizes the fund because you leave you leave the inflation proofing in in the fund from the outset. When you do POMB, you're leaving the the inflation proofing amount. Uh, in the in the permanent fund from the outset, uh, and then it's splitting the remainder equally between between government and uh, uh, and uh, and citizens. Now, under the old approach, under the statutory net income approach, because uh, all of inflation proofing was assigned over to government, uh, and the PFD didn't have to bear any of that cost, uh, the PFD was was a higher amount. Uh, Actually, Alaskans were getting something like 67, 68, 69 percent of the of the statutory net earnings. Uh, government, but the split between uh, uh, the PFD and between citizens and government was about 67 percent citizens uh, and about 33 percent, 30 percent government. Now it will it will come back to being a true 50-50 after after taking into account inflation proofing. That does reduce the amount of the PFD from the old approach um, uh, because now the the PFD portion is 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 paying a share of inflation proofing, uh, and it's not it's not an in, insignificant amount. It will reduce uh, the amount of that goes to the permanent fund by roughly 400 uh, million dollars at at, uh, at current numbers. Um, and and so that w- that will come off what had been the statutory uh, the statutory uh, uh, PFD, but but it's a fairer approach uh, and an approach that better preserves the permanent fund going forward. This story in the Alaska Journal talks about how one of the ideas being floated is a seventy five twenty five split, seventy five going to government, and basically it says it roughly balances the budget if you have a di- dividend of this size, which would have been about eleven hundred dollars and no other policy changes. Isn't this the end goal when it's all said and done, not changing a thing, just taking the money from Alaskans? <laughs> it is. I mean, so so the 75-25 split is essentially the same thing as saying we're going to take all of the deficit out of the PFD. 
um, uh, and and the PFDs, uh, PFD tax is going to be the way we're going to pay for uh, any deficit that shows up in government. And and no policy changes is code is code words for we're not going to we're not going to reduce the budget any further. So yeah, it, it that means that we're going to take uh, all of it out of the PFD, not just not just balance the PFD at 50-50 after inflation, uh, but we're going to continue drawing down the PFD, reducing the PFD in order to pay for any remaining deficit. I, the, going from 50-50, um, going from 50-50 uh, uh, under the statute, going from the current statutory approach uh, down to uh, POMV 50-50 reduces the deficit, the nine-year deficit, average deficit over the nine years, uh, from about a billion three dollar billion three to about uh, 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 about eight hundred million. Um, so it it reduces the uh, deficit materially uh, from coming from uh, the current statutory approach down to POMB fifty fifty, uh, but it uh, doesn't wipe out the deficit. Right. And basically, <laughs> what the what what the what the proposal is what what going to seventy five twenty five does is to try to wipe out the remaining deficit simply by cutting the PFD further. Right. It again shows that what we have here is we have a spending and a revenue problem. What do are, what are people not know about this, Brad? I mean, what do are, what are people, when they see this and they hear this, and I know Shelly is starting to take some heat in her district over this, but is this the equity, in your mind, is this the most equitable solution to this whole problem? Is this 50-50 split? I mean, I mean essentially, since you've already admitted and we've kind of acknowledged on the program that there is just not the political will to fix the spending problem that we have in this state? Yeah, it's the most equitable approach. It's an approach that, that, that frankly, uh, I've advocated for the last few years uh, because it, it right, right now when we, using the current statute, right now we're shorting government its share. Government's not getting a full 50% because we're taking the inflation proofing out of only out of the government side. So we're shorting government. And, and the result of shorting government, as we found out, is to increase pressure on cutting the PFD or increase the need for new revenues. Government, government should get its share of the permanent fund earnings stream. It, 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 we, we need to do that. We need to do that to be consistent with, with Hamilton's approach. Um, and, we're, and this current statutory approach doesn't do that. So changing it to POMV 5050 um, uh, after taking inflation proofing off the top of both sides, changing it to POMV 50 is a lot fairer approach. It improves what government's getting. Government's no longer taking the hit of having to having to pay for inflation proofing entirely out of its share, uh, and it and it's a much better reflection, much more equitable split. Of, of the revenues being taken out of the out of the, the POM out, out of the permanent fund, but it doesn't solve the entire budget problem. It it starts moving down. The budget problem falls from a billion two deficit down to an eight hundred million dollar deficit, uh, averaged over nine years. It doesn't solve that deficit, and and we need other tools in order to be able to solve the remaining deficit. A combination of spending reductions. Um, and and a flat tax, for example, uh, or uh, a combination of spending reductions and some other revenue source, uh, but but POMV 5050 is a step in the process of getting this problem resolved. Jonathan asks, why isn't the inflation proofing done prior to the draw? Uh, withdrawing to the government and expecting to put it back seems very trusting, is what he's saying. But I think that's what essentially what this 50-50 plan would be, right? It takes it out, it inflation proofs, and then it splits the remainder amongst the citizens on the PFD side and the government on the other side. Is that is that am I reading that right? That that's exactly right. POMV the the POMV approach does take inflation proofing out before the money is split between government and the PFD. It does exactly does exactly what Jonathan's asking. Um, uh, the current approach is the problematic one. The current approach is is government gets the inflation proofing, then has to put it back. Uh, the POMV leaves that money uh, uh, in the permanent fund. Doesn't take doesn't take it out initially. And of course, the best uh, idea in this whole thing would be to enshrine if we're going to do it to enshrine that into a constitutional amendment so that it can't be 
futzed with later on down the road. And, of course, the, the biggest thing, the biggest heartburn I have with this whole deal is that the government is already getting, you know, 90 percent of all revenues. I mean, they're already getting, yep. you know, all the different taxes and severance taxes and everything else. And all we'll get all they're all we're taking is we're getting an earning chunk off of 25 percent of the royalties. The government's getting everything else. And it's still not enough. Yeah, exactly right. I mean, I we, we have we have built a state that we can't afford based upon the revenue streams that we have. I mean, you and I have been saying that for seven years now. We've been running deficits in this state uh, for seven years. But we found out last legislature that, that we don't even have 16 <laughs> willing to support the governor uh, in making the level of cuts necessary uh, to, to, to handle this problem through – through cuts only. I mean, the governor's initial, even the governor's initial budget didn't, didn't balance the the budget. It still was $400 million short. After the first set of vetoes, he was still 600, 500, 600 million dollars short. Um, and, and after the, the, the legislature then went back, backed up on that, we're now $900 million short. He didn't have 16 with him in the legislature 16 out of 60. He didn't have 16 with him to stick at those at those deeper cut numbers. Right. Uh, uh, legislate, legislators uh, flaked off uh, when when push came, came to shove. So yes, I mean yes, we're spending too much right. uh, relative to the revenues that we have. But we're going to continue to do that. Well, Pamela says this will not address the problem of overspending. It actually feeds the problem to some degree. I mean, I would disagree at this point because what they're seeing is they see that big pile of money out there, and that's what they'll continue to travel after. They'll continue to jack the spending to inflate this crisis, to keep the crisis there and in the forefront, so they always have a justification for taking more of that money. Until you take that off the table by locking it into a 50-50, a constitutional amendment, either statutory or the 50-50, one of the two, I don't care which one, until you lock that away and take that money off the table, they're going to continue to pursue it. That's right, Michael. And 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 the other point that, that we've talked about on the show previously is until all Alaskans have to face up to paying money for government, uh, we're not going to get this crisis resolved. I mean, the thing about the PFD using using PFD cuts to fund government is it shoves the burden mostly off on middle and lower income Alaska families. The top 20 percent pay a trivial amount of their income right. uh, through through PFD taxes. Right. Only we're only going to get this resolved if all Alaskans have to face up and pay for uh, uh, pay for an equitable share of the cost of government. If the top 20 percent, if Natasha von Imhoff had to pay the same amount of her income, the same 8, 10, 20 percent amount of her income that she's forcing off on middle and lower income Alaska families, if she had to pay that out of her income, by gosh, we would have spending. Yep. Thank you so much. We're going to send right. people out to the website to take a look at it. Thank you. Michael, as always, thanks for having me. Well, that's a wrap for another week's edition of the Weekly Top 3 from Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Thank you again for joining us. Remember that you can find past episodes on our YouTube and SoundCloud pages. And keep track of us during the week on Facebook and Twitter. This has been Brad Keithley, Managing Director of Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. We look forward to you joining us again next week on the Weekly Top 3.